Welcome to the Greater Montana Foundation Legacy Project, preserving the history of Montana broadcasting and the pioneers of communication whose vision and foresight brought together the people of Montana. Hello, I'm Vic Miller, and joining me is uh, legendary country music broadcaster Len Lonnie Bell. He's been a fixture in Billings broadcasting for almost half a century. Lonnie, good to have you here. Thank you, Vic. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to see you and talk to you. Thank you, you very much. You and me, we were just discussing how long we'd been doing this you know, a few minutes ago. <laughs> we started about the same time. Right, you know? yeah. right, back when the crust of the earth was cooling. <laughs> yeah, somebody said, uh, somebody said, Lonnie, was in the Navy so far back that his service number was in Roman numerals. <laughs> so the first time he got put on a report was for having a dirty bow and arrow. <laughs> but nevertheless, we I've always, I used to tell a joke and I heard you tell once, you know, I, I kind of stole it from you. Here in Billings, we were having a, uh, uh, one of those days when, and one of those winters when we had a lot of potholes in the road mm -hmm. and you was on the air and you said, you said that uh, you uh, run into one of your friends and and he was in a pothole, just his head was sticking out. And you said that, uh, you asked him, you said, uh, can I help you? And he said, uh, no, he said, I'll get out, I'm on my horse. <laughs> that was yours, <laughs> how'd you do that? <laughs> well, how, how, how'd you come to get into uh, this business in the first place? Well, I started in this business, uh, you know, when I was 10 years old, picking and singing, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Navy when I was about 16 years old and stayed in the Navy until I retired. And we, uh, and I was always, uh, I played rhythm guitar and I, and I was a pretty good kid singer. I could sing pretty good when I was 8, 10, 11, 12 years old. And so during the Depression, about 1934, we had a neighbor uh, that had uh, all kinds of boys and girls and they were all musicians. So they brought the first beer joint to our, our little town in 1934. That was when beer came back mm -hmm. in. And my mother was unhappy about that. She was sitting on the front porch and but she was watching the coal miners go in now this they took an old dwelling house and turned it into a uh, a bar you know for beer and so she said if you and uh, bunt and tommy tommy absher and bunt absher his brother tommy played fiddle and bunt played guitar they didn't sing but i was about 10 and i could sing mm -hmm. so she said if you boys will go over there and get on the porch of that house and start picking and singing she said they'll them miners will give you money she said and that's before jukebox jukebox didn't come along about 37. <laughs> so anyways we did that and that's that was the beginning right there Huh. And then you just kept uh, trucking along. Yeah, and I went, of course, I went to the Navy, and I joined the Navy in 19, uh, November 26, 1940, and I uh, come out in, in 1960. And uh, during the uh, Berlin airlift in 1949, I, my squadron was on that, and I was with them, of course. We come back and went back to Honolulu, and got back to Honolulu in, in September of 49. And so there was nothing to do, and we were all, you know, we had so many people and didn't have nothing for people to do. We were mm -hmm. over, completely overdrafted at that time. They'd closed Fort Island and brought 100 people over. So we started, uh, we, we've got a, you know, a fellow named Davis, got a band together. And then there's some boys out of Barber's Point, they had a band together. So we all come together and we got, had a couple of live shows, one at KAHU and uh, out in Waipahu near Pearl. And then we had uh, the big station downtown on Saturday evening. Well, one day in 1953, uh, the uh, program director of KHU out in Waipahu, a fellow named Kurt Butler, he came to me and he said, uh, I want you to be a country disc jockey. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I can't even hardly, I, I said, I'm not a very good reader. I can't, oh, that's okay. He said, I'll teach you. So he taught me and that's, and eight months later, I was the number one jock in Honolulu. Oh my gosh. And they had 10 radio stations, no TV at that time. Mm -hmm. And they had some pretty good boys. They had uh, Jay Ock, they had Papuli and Lucky, Lucky Luck and those guys. But they were on the morning and I was on one, at, from 11.30 to 1.30. And my show carried 28.8, I think it was, of old oh Hooper, Hooper, the old Hooper rating, remember? Mm -hmm. Hooper oh, ratings, yeah. yeah. Well, that was big. So then in 54, I come back to the States. And while I was out there, I played the first Elvis Presley record, you know. Mm -hmm. It was played, played in Honolulu and this type of thing. And I played a lot of people's first records. And of course, uh, People come out there and visit, people like you know, Tennessee Ernie Ford and Patty Page. I met all those people, see. And that's, uh, so then when I when I come out on 20 in 1960, I was up in uh, Anacortes, Washington at the Naval Air Station out at Whidbey Island. Mm. I was in VP2, it was my last squadron. And I went to work at uh, Anacortes, uh, at Kajit, uh, K-A-G-T, and there I met Loretta Lynn, and that's where all that, that mm -hmm. thing happened, you know. But then uh, when I, Finally got out of the Navy and I quit running the, the, 
quit running any, any uh, radio programs at all. For a little while, I became a booker and a, and a promoter. Mm. And so I uh, promoted shows. And then finally, I, uh, I, I was out of the Navy, and I really didn't know how to get by because I'd been in the Navy all my life. I was only 37 years old at that time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything but the Navy. So I really didn't know exactly how to get along with people. And it took me about a couple of years to even, you know, catch on. That, that, and I was, I, was, I was riding on a different ship, you know. Sure. And so anyway, I, uh, I came to uh, Spokane in 1961, and they, they turned K, KPEG, KPG, into a, 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 a full-time country station. And a fellow named Dick White, of course, was the manager. So I went over there to Sp I went to Spokane. I had a family at that time, of course. I took my first family and went over there and uh, went to work there at uh, KPEG. And uh, finally, I went back to Tacoma. I got a better job at KMO in Tacoma. And then one day, I quit KMO Tacoma because they was making me work nights. And I was 37 years old then. I didn't want to work nights no. all the time. So about that time, I had a friend named Gary Todd, who I'd worked with at KPEG the year before. He had come to Billings. Oh. See? And he gave me, he called me long distance from Billings. And he said, I came down here for Del Cody and turned this station country in November. And he said, uh, now I want to leave. I want to go back and to Spokane and get my wife. And he said, I want you to come down and relieve me for a couple of weeks. And he said, just a couple of weeks, all you got to stay. <laughs> so I came down to relieve him, and I did. I came down to Billings and got here on the 10th of February, 1964, I got here. And uh, so, he stayed about three days and he left and so help me I haven't seen him since or I never heard tell of him again never I don't know where the fellow went I don't know where he went but I never did hear from him more the more so anyway so that's how I got into Billings you know and then of course uh, we had a great crew there we had Bob Thompson you remember Bob oh, sure. the late but the late Bob Thompson and uh, Hal Thomas the late Hal Thomas and and uh, a Mac, of course, and Alice, and all the all crew. Everybody is, a, there's a, I think just about everybody, except I think there's three of us still living, Lewis and, and Lamont and myself, mm -hmm. Lamont Wallace, of course, yeah. here. And you're, you're, you know Lamont. He's, oh, yeah. He's, you know, Monty Wallace. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, uh, Monty Wallace, he helped me so much with the March of Dimes horseback ride, you know. Mm -hmm. He was uh, just a teenager at that time, you know. And uh, so we... Uh, when I got here, I, I just felt at home here because the folks here were so good to me and so friendly. And the ranchers and all, everybody, they took me in and just, I went to, I, I, got, I got acquainted with the Todd boys up in, uh, in Big Timber, uh, uh, the late Don Todd and, and his, uh, his old, older son, son, Sonny, Sonny Todd. We're still, still buddies, me and Sonny Todd. He was on my show Sunday morning, in fact. Okay. Yeah. And so between the... Don Todd and Hal Thomas and myself and Sonny, we figured up the March of Dimes horseback ride that we did in 1965. We did it the, the last Sunday in 1965. Uh, I started broadcasting. I was on mornings. Well, I got on mornings. I told you how I got on mornings. Mr. Crane had recommended me for going on mornings, yes. you know, to Mr. Williams, and they put me on mornings. And uh, anyway, the last Sunday in January 1965, he had, I had a four-year-old horse named uh, Tom Thumb, and Tom Thumb had never been off the ranch, but uh, they, Don and Sonny, they taught me how to ride that horse, you know, and they taught me how to handle myself, because I, Hal Thomas and myself and, and Don, we cooked up, we was going to do this thing for a benefit. The March of Dimes month was January, you know. Sure. Yeah, always going to count a Roosevelt's birthday, you know. Right. President Roosevelt's birthday. And uh, so anyway, he, and he started the, the March of Dimes. He had polio, you know. March, Franklin mm -hmm. D did, FDR did, yeah. And uh, so we, uh, we sure enough, come the last Sunday, they bundled me up, put me on that horse, and, and I started down the highway. And I rode all the way to Columbus by myself. And just, uh, just on this side of Columbus, I saw a fellow pull a trailer up and, and got out, you know, and, and backed his horse up. Well, and while this was going on, Monty Wallace was on the radio on K on uh, coin mm -hmm. KOY and radio he was on and he was giving my position all the time oh okay they, they were calling my wife and uh, and Sonny's wife and Sonny and the the whole gang they would they would call Monty and they'd tell him and he'd tell the audience where I was you know and they had a lot of bets going I couldn't make it they didn't know it <laughs> and I 
their money wasn't too all that safe because I almost didn't. <laughs> I was almost dead when I got here. <laughs> you were not born in the saddle. <laughs> uh, no, I was not. I wasn't back in the saddle again. That's for sure. But anyway, and so we did that for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. we, we did that. We, we, and I think the second and third and fourth years of that, we had every road covered in Spokane. I mean, in the buildings. We had uh, Ch Chuck Rogers used to come out of Hardin, and, and then the Roundup fellas came out of Roundup, and Jimmy Green came in from uh, Prior Creek, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and the list just goes on and on. It was uh, got to be a big thing. And finally, when the, when the horse was 20 years old, I took him back to Big Timber and uh, and gave him to Sonny. Sonny turned him loose. In the meantime, Mr. Todd, he had he had passed away in 1974. Uh, Don had Sonny's father. He was the one who gave me the horse. Oh, okay. And he was a kind of a rancher. He was always a, he was a fun guy, you know. Don Todd was. And uh, he gave me that horse in a, in a roundabout way, and I didn't understand how people did things in Montana because. But one day, me and him was riding on his ranch. I got got acquainted with him, and he was and he gave me that horse to ride. And he's riding along. It's, it's like in August. We we're moving some cattle, and I was helping him move some cattle. And he looked at me and he says, "You know, I think I'm going to give you that horse." He says because he said, "It's such a great horse." He says, "If I if I ride him, I'll scald his back. I'll burn his his back." And he said, I, "I'm too heavy for him." He was a smaller horse, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think he even growed more after that, you know. But anyway, so that's all he said, hmm. you know. And that was like in August. So I thought he was just, you know, t just making conversation. I, I never heard. Nobody never gave me anything before, <laughs> <laughs> especially like a ho a fine horse like that, you know, wonderful horse. Oh, so anyway, uh, so finally one day he came down to the radio station in, in December. This is how this March of Diamonds thing started, really. He came down to the radio station at, uh, at Coin. He came in and he looked at Hal Thomas and he said to Hal Thomas, he said, what do you think about a guy, you give him a horse in August, he makes you feed him all winter. <laughs> so I said, was you serious? Well, sure, I gave him to you last August. Mm -hmm. said, so then he started, how, he said, you got a trailer? You don't even got a bridle, he said. You don't even own a bridle. <laughs> he goes on and on. So finally, why, uh, how are you going to get him to build this? I said, well, I looked at Hal, I said, Hal, I guess I'll have to ride him. So Todd says, oh, don't overreach now, you know. <laughs> and he knew all the, and so Hal Thomas said, well, he'd come from, Hal had come from uh, Seattle with me. I'd known Hal for a long time. Hal says, I've known Lonnie for a long time. If he says he'll ride him, he'll ride him. So Todd, so we got on, we started that promotion. And it was one of the finest promotions I, I was ever mixed up in. We, uh, there was times, there was some, some years, we'd have as many as 200 people riding, mm. you know. We got up to where we was getting five, six thousand dollars one day in cash mm. on, on Sunday. And a lot and of we, different weather conditions. One time, Jake Frank helped me a lot with it out of Park City, the late Jake Frank. Mm -hmm. We come into Park City once, I recall, when it was 31 below zero. Always the last Sunday in January. Yeah. And uh, just had a lot of fun with it, yeah. you know. And then, of course, uh, uh, Monty. Uh, finally, he went on to become the program director and finally the manager. And he started with us when he was a teenager, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one day that uh, he, when they didn't have anything for him to do, uh, we had a ditch out there and we had a little, little, little wooden bridge across that ditch. One day I come along there, my car coming back into the radio station, and I, I see this guy underneath the, under there hammering away, you know. So I, I got out and looked down there and it was, it was Monty, Monty Wallace. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, Bob's got me fixing a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was okay, you know. He's, he's still, still a good buddy, you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a very good friend, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking before we went on the air. Uh, at one time in the mid '50s, when I was working for Cook Radio, I had a program called Cook's Cow Country Classics. Yeah. Played a lot of Western music, and at that time, there was pretty clear-cut line between Western music and pop music. Yes. And then you had a big crossover, like uh, Marty Robbins. Yeah. It was theoretically a country music singer. Absolutely. And then the white sports coat and the pink carnation yes. came out, and that blasted into the pop field. Yes. There's been a lot of crossover. Patty Page was a, had a big yeah. hand in that. She, uh, she had Tennessee Walsh, you know. Mm -hmm. Tennessee Walsh was a song that had been re uh, Pee Wee King and Red Stewart wrote that song in 1945 when they were going along the road at night. Uh, 
at coming back from a job that they was working. Pee Wee King was a whale, just a whale of a band leader. He had the Golden West Cowboys and mm -hmm. since about 1939, you know. And him and, him and Red Stewart wrote some great songs. And of course, they they recorded Tennessee Waltz and it didn't do anything too much in the country. And uh, in fact, there was a story about that uh, in 1949, about a year before Patty cut it, what, uh, Cowboy Copas and Pee Wee King were in a hotel room in Nashville and they were trading songs back and forth and buying and selling between mm -hmm. them, you know. And so uh, Pee Wee offered uh, Cowboy Copas one deal. He said, here, said, I'll take this deal. I'll, I'll sell this to you for this much. And uh, Copas said, I don't want that. And Pee Wee said, I'll throw Tennessee Waltz in just, he said, with it, he said. Cowboy said, no, I don't want that Tennessee Waltz either. Oh. So, <laughs> and, but Pee Wee, when Patty Page recorded, Pee Wee was real glad that Copas didn't take it. <laughs> so a lot of good stories like that. Yeah. yeah. And it uh, even even today, it's, I was surprised that you was that you knew Judy Lynn and and, uh, and and John and all those people. Oh yeah, you did. You you've been on the air a long time, Vic. Yeah, well they used to bring in uh, uh, Grand Old Opry shows to the Shrine Auditorium in Billings. Yeah, they brought in some some neat people over the years. You know, Roy Acuff was here and uh, and all these guys. And I uh, at the time was a good friend of Smokey Mac and the Yellowstone Valley Boys. They played the Midway Club and they do the warm up act. And, and everybody drift down the midway after the uh, Shrine Show. That's right. So you had a chance to meet a, you know, a lot of uh, really interesting and a lot of really good people. Oh, yeah. The, the people uh, was always, I never saw such great people in my life as they got in Montana. Another thing, too, about Montana, now, when I got here, they still had silver dollars. Mm -hmm. They didn't have That was no, the coin of the realm. <laughs> right. And uh, also, they still had the sil silver dollars. And... Um, and this, my friend that came with me, one of my friends who came with me from, from Spokane, uh, he, he come in, he said, I'm going back to Spokane today. I said, why? He said, because he said, I, I passed an Indian lady wearing leggings. That's good enough for me. I'm leaving. He said, he said, this is, he said, you're out west. I said, well, I thought I was out west. And I recall too that about that time there was a, the high sheriff's name was Grant Gatlin in Powder River County. And I said, boy, that's Western. Mm -hmm. This has got to be the West, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and another thing too, I learned too, and I learned it uh, uh, about the people around Reed Point, you know, and Big Timber and the ranchers. The ranch people, the ranch people in, in this country, see, they never got to Grand Ole Opry here, mm -hmm. as you remember. The right. WSM Grand Ole Opry never come in here. Mm -hmm. And these people all loved Western music. And the ranch families to me were, they were highly educated people, and they had pianos in their homes, and they were great people. They had uh, educated children, and they was look at look at they, Van Cleve wrote a book. Remember him? Oh yeah, yeah. Those, these yep. these ranch these ranch families were, and they live way out in the country. Mm -hmm. Like you can go down to Pompey's Pillar, going down to Yellowstone to Pompey's Pillar, right now, and you can go take that dirt road and go forty miles, and you come out and you come into Melstone, and on that dirt road way out there there's ranches all along out there. oh yeah and and i kept thinking how do they get their kids to school and then of course they they do all manner of things they park cars and leave them and they they, they board them in town mm -hmm. but the ranch families here were simply great people most of them had a piano in their home so they were they were they were they were hep, hep on everything right yeah they were real hep people <laughs> you know i think i think they were more hep people than what you'd find in a suburban a suburb of a city mm -hmm. a, a whole lot better Still are. Yeah. You bet, yeah. Tell us uh, a little bit about your association with uh, Loretta Lynn. Loretta Lynn? Yep. Well, uh, Loretta Lynn, I was learning a dance up at um, a place called the Fredonia Grange Hall in Mount, in Mount Vernon. I was running a record hop, you know, there on Saturday night. But it was a country and western record hop. And a fellow named uh, Nelly, uh, this, he was at the radio station in Mount Vernon, he was running a rock hop, you know, the same. And uh, he would draw a little more people with me, but I'd draw three or 400 people, and I was charged a dollar a head for to get in. Well, I had a band, and I had a, a, a couple of singers. And one day, uh, my fiddle player, the, the, the late Bill uh, O'Connor, Bill, Bill O'Connor said, uh, I told him, I said, Bill, we gotta get another singer. I need another singer. And he said, I, we had a fellow who had quit and left, you know. And he said, well, I know where this girl could sing pretty good. He said, she's singing up in, uh, in Bellingham at the Barry Collegiate Club right now. He said, she sings there on Wednesday night. He said, 
I've been going over there and playing fiddle for him on Wednesday night. See, our, our dance was only on Saturday night, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, oh, he said, yeah, I've been running over and playing fiddle with him. He said, gee, he seemed pretty good. And I said, well, why don't you go ahead and hire him and bring her on? It was quite a ways from Anna Cordes up to Bellingham in those days. See, me like I was about 60 miles or so. It was a long way. And rainy at night, and the old road was narrow, too, you know, along the coast. You mm -hmm. know? And I didn't want to go up there. So he said, no, no, you got to come here. He said, I know you, you might not like it. It's your dance, and I think you, you should go and hire her. And, and I said, well, I'll come up and listen to her. So I did. On Wednesday night, I went up there. And I, went, I was a member of the American Legion Club because I'd, already, I'd been in, in all the wars sure. and stuff like that. And so I, I asked them where the band was. They said down in the basement. Well, I got down there about 9 o'clock. There wasn't nobody there yet, just me and the bartender. You know, nobody comes to a bar until 10, 11 o'clock, you know. Right. <laughs> you remember that? That's easy to remember, you know. Right. So anyway, so pretty quick, here they come. And they and Bill come out to play fiddle, you know, and, and Roland Smiley was playing steel and that's the only two names I remember now, the fiddle and the steel. And now see this little guy up there running around. He's, he's putting speakers down, all this kind of stuff, you know. That was Mooney, you know. So anyway, uh, finally they, they bring her out. And, I, and I, I looked at that and I thought, man, if this girl can sing at all, she is good looking. What a beautiful lady, you know. Mm -hmm. Beautiful lady. So I said to myself, if she can sing at all, I'll hire her, you know. So I... Uh, she started singing, started singing, How's the World Treating You? I never heard such singing in my whole life. Eddie Arnold, I, I had the same feeling about Eddie Arnold when I heard him in 45 mm -hmm. that I had her that night. And I, I, and I told everybody from that day on, everywhere I went, I told everybody Loretta Lynn was the greatest singer in my life. And uh, she'll back me up on that because the last time she was here, she, she, she dedicated her whole show to me. You know? mm -hmm. She told everybody, she said, Lonnie played so many Loretta Lynn records, said, that uh, uh, they didn't think, he, so, so he, they called him up and said, you got nothing but Loretta Lynn records? <laughs> that happened, but anyway, so anyway, she, uh, and there was a fellow up in uh, Vancouver, Vancouver was 90 mile up the road, Vancouver, British Columbia, and there was a fellow up there named Briley, and Briley had a record company. I didn't know, it. I later found out he was, he was, a, he was a lumberman uh, dealer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, but he, he sent me, he'd send me down records. People used to send, send us all kinds of records in those sure. days. You got records from everybody, you know. And uh, the, he'd sent me down a couple of records of some people. That they they was they were good kids, I'm sure, but they wasn't good enough to play on my show. So uh, finally, I, and I told Mooney, I said, Mooney, your wife is is good enough to be a star. So he took that with kind of a, a you know a smile and walked away. But a couple of days a couple of days later, he came back. And he said, Was you serious? I said, yes. And I told him, I said, I've been a DJ. I've been a DJ then for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. See. I started back in 53. And so anyway, uh, I helped her all I could. And finally that guy Briley signed her and put her on the Zero record and sent her to Los Angeles. And when he got down there, why uh, this promoter named uh, Greshi, uh, Don, Don, Don Gresham, Don Gresh, Don Greshi, his name was Don Greshi. Mm -hmm. Don Greshi hired real good musicians at Capitol Records to, to back her. He, uh, Speedy West, and Roy Lanham, them two, mm -hmm. great. Roy Lanham worked for, for uh, Speedy, for uh, Roy Lanham worked for Roy Rogers. Speedy West worked for uh, Cliffy Stone in Tennessee, Ernie, and all those guys. And they were just great. So they they heard her sing, and then from there on, all she needed to be was just heard. And we sat down and we set out 1,300 records to all these radio stations. We had a, we had a mm -hmm. list of radio stations, and uh, and so they, you know, they never give me any money or anything, or I never had any. Uh, they asked me one night. In fact, one night uh, they asked me. This the three of us together. They asked me. They said, and Mooney asked me. He said, "What do you What do you want out of all this?" And I said, "Hey, I said I don't I don't want nothing." I said, "Record one of my songs someday, will you?" Mm -hmm. And she never has done it. <laughs> I wrote one for her, but Necker turned it down a long time ago. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's that was the whole thing right there. Uh. She just come along. Just a girl that come along while I was DJing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it happens. Those great things to remember, though, aren't they? Well, yeah, and it's it just, and it, then, of course, I had a lot of uh, relatives back in West Virginia because I was from West Virginia. I had 35 first cousins when I left West Virginia. Oh, so, okay. So I told all those people about her. And then the one thing that, that made Loretta Lynn, she wrote Cool Miner's Daughter. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, there was 400,000 United Mine Workers in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia. There's 400,000 mm -hmm. miners. 
There's 400,000 miners, coal miners in this country at that time. And I think most all of them was in the union, mm -hmm. you know, you know, in Kentucky. And some of those coal mines that her father worked in, my father worked in the same coal mines. She, she grew up about 30 miles from where I, I came from Boone County, West Virginia. She come from Pikeville. Oh, okay. That's where the McCoys was. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I, I helped them all I could, you know, and they was always good to me and kind to me. And That's still great. Both, Loretta and I are still friends, you know. We have a couple of minutes left. You, uh, you're still on the air. Yes, I am. I'm on every Sunday morning from uh, 8 to 12 on K K G KGHL and also 98.5. I simulcast on two stations. Mm -hmm. I think I'm the only guy around that does that today. I simulcast on two stations. And, uh, and we, uh, and uh, Ed McIntosh is my sidekick. Works mm -hmm. here, right here at Q2. Right. Yeah. Everybody sees Ed here and he, he uh, comes, works with me on Sunday morning. And he's been working with me now for about off and on for a couple of years, you know, and uh, just doing great. And we, the show seems to be, you know, we got about a thousand people on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We get, uh, we get, we got people listening to us in, in Florida, New York, and, and uh, lots of places. You, know. you play a lot of traditional. I play, uh, uh, I play pretty much, I play classic people and classic songs. Mm -hmm. See, it, I was always one of those disc jockeys. I went by the song. The song is what makes the, makes the man a star, or a lady a star, is a song. They've all got what they call a signature song. Sure. You know, and you hear uh, a lot of people talk about signature song. And so, uh, but, but I'd like for everybody to tune me in. We're at 7.90 a.m. and 98.5 f.m. from 8 to 12 every Sunday morning. And we're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get on the Facebook, well, just, just dial up Lonnie Bell there, the Google up the Lonnie Bell and get on there. <laughs> and we have about, we got about 1,000 people on it now. I work for Taylor Brown. Taylor Brown owns KJHL. Mm -hmm. Taylor Brown is one of the fine. He's one of the finest owners I ever worked for, and I've only I've been working for him now for almost two years, and he's just one of the best I ever I ever come in contact. He's a great with. guy. Yeah. Oh, Taylor Brown and his wife Shannon. Yep. They just don't make finer people. He did an ag report when I was anchoring the noon news, and last year I was. Uh, yeah, working yeah. full time for the. Well, I, I don't miss you on Thursday evening. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're watching. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> We've run out of time, but I'd like to uh, thank you for coming down and talking with us. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Nice, 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 nice to come. Thank you very thank you much. much. Thank you, sir. And my guest has been uh, Lonnie Bell, who's been a fixture in Billings Broadcasting for almost half a century, and I might add, a member of the. Montana Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Congratulations on that. Thank you, sir. And that's our program for today. I'm Vic Miller. Thanks for watching. This programming series is brought to you by the Greater Montana Foundation, benefiting the people of Montana through communication of issues, trends, and values of importance for present and future generations of Montanans. And by the Montana Historical Society, Big Sky, Big Land, Big History. And with the help of Cordillera Communications, with stations in Billings, Bozeman, Butte, Great Falls, Missoula, Kalispell, and Helena, Cordillera Communications, the Montana Television Network.